So yeah, Amazon snuck a roughly four minute scene from season two into the show at the very end of episode eight of season one. No announcement, no specific tweet about it. They just put it in there and they hinted at it in a very circumspect way. They began with the Wheel of Time Twitter account liking tweets on Twitter. Yes, I refuse to call it X. They were liking tweets in groupings of eight. So for a bunch of random people, they just liked eight of their tweets, which was very subtle. Then people began noticing the extra content at the end of the episode. So what was the content? Well, it was a full freaking scene, potentially one of the cold opens. I would guess probably the cold open to the entire season, and it had some surprising stuff in it. So today we're going to break it all down. But first, make sure to like the video so YouTube shows it to more people. If you're feeling up to it, go ahead and subscribe to the channel as well as there is a lot of stuff coming out with the show dropping later this month. But let's go ahead and dive into this scene. We'll kick things off with this shot of a star-shaped building in the middle of a very dense forest with ominous clouds and mountains in the background. Now, it doesn't give us much of a clue as to where this might be in the story, but this is clearly a drone shot, and we found out that production was doing drone shots all the way back in September of 2021. This building, which in English is called the Star Summer Palace, is a building in Chechia that was used in August of 2021 for exterior shots. Now, I would assume what we see later in this clip that is filmed on the interior was filmed at like an interior set, probably not at this building, but definitely those those external images come from that shoot. All of that information is courtesy of Wattseries.com all the way back in 2021. But also in this clip, as we get in closer, we can see a well-lit entrance area where the majority of the clip is going to take place. Take note what appear to be six statues. Now, that specific number is going to come back and be very important as we break all of this down. Also note that there are six points on the star that the building represents. That could all be coincidence, but I'm not so sure, and we'll explore this in a minute as we go through the clip. Here we have a little girl, the same girl we saw in the trailer, but playing outside. Now that we've got a better look at her, though, this is clearly not the same girl that shows up in a later part of the trailer with Perrin. I would judge her clothing here to represent her being one of the Tinkers, but again, more on that in a moment. Right here in the background is one of those statues I mentioned before still standing. And I say standing because we get this shot of one of them being on the ground. Now, this is where a lot of the speculation in this clip comes from. There is a lot to unpack with what we see here, with some questions being answered and some more being posed. So let's Let's start with the fact that this is an eight-pointed star, not a six-pointed star like the villa, and also like the number of statues. Remember that there are six, not eight. Let's also remember that all the way back in episode five of season one, Steppen had eight figurines that represented the Forsaken. There are conveniently eight stars on this statue piece. Also in episode eight of season one, this is an almost exact replica of the ground at the Eye of the World, where Rand just fought against who he thought at the time was the dark one. More on that in a moment as well. Now, although we cannot say for sure, I think it's fair to guess that the eight Forsaken have an awful lot to do with these eight points on this star. Take a look at the graphics represented on the statue as well. They're all different symbols. If I had to guess on these, I would say the symbols all represent a Forsaken. This one here probably represents a Shamael, as this is the image that is the cracked one at the end of episode eight, season one. This one here looks to be a spider, so that's possibly Mogidian. There is another one here that looks like the golden bees insignia so that might mean samuel but uh, frankly i'm kind of skeptical of that one uh, it would not make a whole ton of sense because these statues were presumably made in the age of legends and Ilian wasn't even a thing till like 2000 years ago now they could change the lore but i'm not entirely sure why that would be a worthy change but it's worth pointing out at least i have a video coming out later this week breaking down the forsaken which ones are being introduced and which ones are being cut and how I think they're going to fit into the story. So keep an eye out for that one. One other thing of note here before we move on, although they look extremely similar, this is not the exact same as the other like it at the eye of the world. Notice where the light and the dark meet on the symbol of the Aes Sedai. Notice where it does here at the eye. I have no idea if that means anything. I just thought this was worth pointing out. If you have any ideas as to why these might be a little different, let me know in the comments of the video. Now, as the little girl turns and looks back at the lights approaching from the distance, we also notice that this is the only statue that has been knocked down. Now, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. For one, 
we know Ashamayel was released last season. We actually hear him say it here in a moment. That would seem to correspond with the broken statue. We also remember them implying that this was one of the seals on the Dark One's prison. So the natural thought from this would be that the seals on the Dark One's prison are also in the same places as where the Forsaken are imprisoned. But here's the problem with that. The problem is, is that if there are eight Forsaken as it seems, and there are six statues that represent the seals. So either the statues don't represent the seals, or there are going to be six seals and eight Forsaken, and possibly multiple Forsaken sealed away within each seal? But if that was the case, wouldn't the only way to free all the Forsaken be to break all the seals, and wouldn't that release the Dark One? So this is where I begin to have more questions than answers. I'd like to understand a bit more about what is happening, specifically with the Forsaken, and how they're sealed away, and ultimately how they're going to be released, but it does appear from the trailer that Ashamayel will be using the One Power in some way to free Lanfear, or at least that's the way it's edited, so we will find out soon enough. But back to the clip. We see these figurines with torches as they come closer, and they are clearly three Trollocs who come chasing after the girl. She, of course, runs away, just making it inside before a Trolloc smashes into the door. Now, as she's running inside, we again see a six-sided hexagon over the door. So I'm not entirely sure if this is part of the building in real life or not, but they obviously made the choice to keep it in the shot either way, so it must be significant. Again, likely something to do with the six statues outside the building. As the girl runs inside, we see a bunch of people sitting around a table, obviously the dark friend social that we saw in the trailer. We can also see a Shamael here as she runs underneath the table. On the right side of her, though, we see a white gloved hand with a white robe. Now, my guess is this is a white cloak. Shocking. But as she goes under the table, we hear a Shamael talking, and he says, There is now one who walks the world, one who was and will be, but is not yet the dragon, Randall Thor. He released me at the eye of the world, and he thinks he can hide. He cannot. While all of this is happening, though, we get some nice shots of people sitting around the table, and I think this is a very clever way for them to show who's at the Dark Friend Social. So some of these are obvious, and some not so much. But here we get what is clearly a member of the Shan Chan High Blood based on the name. I think this is very likely Suroth, considering we know she's in this season, and we also know she's a dark friend. Here we also get a close-up of a gloved hand that has an Aes Sedai ring with what looks like a black stone in it. Now, it's possible that it's red and it only looks black because of the lighting, but I think that it is likely a black stone to signify the black Aja. Now, this could be accomplished through a weave, or maybe they just have a, a, another ring lying around that they use. That seems pretty dangerous to me, though, I think. But at the same time, we see that gloved hand with the Aes Sedai. I ring, we hear a female voice say, we are to kill him. And I can't decide if it sounds like Leandrin or not, but we are certainly meant to believe that it is the Aes Sedai talking here. We know Leandrin isn't the only black Aja, but it's likely that it is her, in my opinion, as she's the most well-known and it would be obvious. But one thing to keep in mind, though, is that those that have only watched the show don't know that Leandrin's a dark friend yet. So maybe this is still a secret. We then get this shot of a Shinarin cloak. And again, this is almost certain certainly Ingtar, who we know will be in the story this season, and chasing the Horn of Valir, which is possessed currently by another guy at the table. So we'll talk about that in a minute too. Then we get this shot of a woman who is wearing what looks like Tinker clothing and is pretty clearly the girl's mother. However, at this time, Ashamael notices her under the table and starts to talk to her. Now, I don't think there's much of a need to break down every single word that is spoken here, but Ashamayel proceeds to mention that there is something outside and acknowledges why the girl is scared and mentions that there might be a monster outside, obviously referring to the Trollocs. He then mentions to her as she comes from under the table that he is also called a monster and other names like Betrayer of Hope and Father of Lies. Well, these are direct references to him being Ashamayel, but also that he believes himself to be the Dark One, possibly. Father of Lies is a name for the Dark One, and Book Ashamayel believed himself to be the Dark One and was essentially batshit crazy. But so far, the, sh the show has not given us batshit crazy Ashamayel, but much more collected and calculated Ashamayel, much more akin to the later incarnation of him that we get from the books. The mention here of Father of Lies is interesting, and it makes me wonder, is this version of Ashamayel truly crazy? Also, we just don't know it yet. Or are they just attributing the name Father of Lies to Ashamayel instead? The last term that he says, though, is that 
people call him forsaken, marking him for sure to be one of them. And then he refers to himself as one of the chosen. He then says to her that if everybody called him what he really was, no one would be afraid. We'll talk more about what he is saying to her thematically at the end of the clip. But then we get this absolutely chilling shot of Pot on Fane, who is also at the Dark Friend Social, as I mentioned earlier. First of all, Johan Myers is just an amazing casting choice. He captures the, the crazy that is Pot on Fane and the evil that is Pot on Fane, in my opinion. Look at that smile. But that being said, I have questions as to why he's here. Pot on Fane is obviously taking a very different role in the show than from the books. He already has the Horn of Valir. He took it at the end of episode eight, season one. So he is technically running away and being chased by Ingtar and his group, which Ingtar is right across the table from him right now. So first, apparently Pot on Fane has been called into this meeting, and I guess Ishamael knows that he has the horn. It's curious that he'd let him take it with him rather than keeping it for himself if he knows that. Or maybe he doesn't know that Pot on Fane has the horn and Pot on Fane is already doing his own thing. Just the mere presence of Pot on Fane at the Dark Friend Social poses a lot of questions. It also makes me think, in addition to the others that are at the meeting, that they must have traveled with the One Power to get here. There are no horses or stables that we saw outside. We saw a nice shot of it. So I think that that's the most likely thing, either that or this is a dream. But why would the mom have brought her daughter in a dream? Again, most likely this was traveling. So maybe Pot on Fane is taking a break from running away with the horn to be here. Interesting, though, that Ingtar is doing the same thing. Do they know that each other are chasing each other or that does Ingtar know that Pot on Fane has the horn? Again, very interesting to find out. The other touch I like here, though, is that you can hear Pot on Fane's creepy whistle thing going on in the background when we see him in this shot. And I love that that's a thing in the show. It's a great tell that he's around and something creepy is going to happen. And I hope they continue to play that up for as long as he's in the show. As Ashamael and the girl walk outside, though, he continues his monologue. He says, how do you prove that you're not a monster? How do you prove good or evil, right or wrong. He then turns to the Trolloc and says, look at this creature, part man, part animal. It is so hard to be something in between. And then he asks, what if he isn't evil? What if he isn't wrong? What if he's just hungry? And then the girl gasps. And I did too while I was watching this because I legit thought he was about to feed her to the damn Trolloc. But instead, they have this session where they pet the Trolloc's head. It turns into a petting zoo. And of course, the Trolloc, if you turn the subtitles on, purrs. And then the scene ends. So this to me was an amazing scene, primarily for the questions that it brings up. To me, this was far more creepy and evil than if he was just being a mustache twirling villain. This is legit how you groom someone to follow the shadow and be evil. He asks questions that seem to challenge the common notion that the Forsaken are bad and that Trollocs are evil and question the very nature of good and evil. The first rule of propaganda is that if you can get people to question the observable truth by just asking questions, then you can slowly manipulate them to change their views to your viewpoint. You leave this scene thinking that Ashamayel might be somewhat misunderstood or that he's good, at least in his own point of view. But that's exactly it. The answers to the questions that he was just asking were wrong. Trollocs are evil. They do evil things. It's not really, oh, is it evil or not? Well, yeah. The only reason that they didn't eat the girl was because he was there and he was clearly convincing her and doing that on purpose. So to me, this is the type of evil I want to see in a Shamael. Calculating, cold, manipulative, and he just kind of exudes power. So what did you think of this clip? Let me know in the comments of the video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel to watch all of the Wheel of Time show and book lore content that will be coming out here in the next couple of months with the release of season two. Hit the bell icon so you are notified when new videos drop. Trust me, there are going to be a bunch here in the near future. Huge, massive thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel and the content that I make. You can see them on the screen here. If you love what I do and you want to show your appreciation, Patreon is the easiest way to do it. Pledge a small amount each month in support for what I do here. I appreciate all of you that already do that. Lastly, if you liked this video, you'll probably like this one here too. Check it out. Thanks for watching, guys. And until the next one, peace out.